the third speaker in this panel, <coughs> Fabien uh, Lipte. Uh, Fabien Lipte is a professor for film studies at the University uh, of Zurich and project leader of the research project Exhibiting Film, Challenges, Challenges of Format. Her research focuses on the aesthetics and theory of filmic images, audiovisual forms of narration, historical and contemporary relationships between the visual arts and media, as well as between cinema and museum. Besides numerous articles and edited volumes, she's also the author of two monographs, Wunderwelten, Märchen im Film, from 2004, and Telling Images, Studien zur Wirklichkeit des Films from 2016, which is on display and on sale um, back on the table there. <laughs> Today, her talk will deal with uh, La Commune, Paris, 1871, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. And after this presentation, we will have a discussion of the three papers. Please. I will just uh, start to talk to you all while this is um, being, and I'm small. <laughs> um, while we are searching for an adapter, I'm a film scholar, I work with a program that is not on the computer, I'm sorry. So, um, in his book, uh, People Expose People as Extras, titled Peuple exposé, peuple figurant, in the French original, Georges Didi Übermann asks the question of how to make of the image a commonplace instead of the mere commonplace of images of the people. So how to make an image or a film that is politically just and that uh, succeeds to make the image um, or to create an image that is based on effective participation. The main protagonists of his book are deliberately not the main protagonists of cinema, but the extras, the many who fill the picture at the margins and in the background as soldiers, slaves, workers, ordinary people, passers by, even revolutionaries. Extras differ from actors precisely in that they do not act. They decorate the picture as living props. They are the numbers, the nameless and voiceless, the non-elected and undiscovered, the swept away and fallen, the many that did not make it on Schindler's list or on Noah's Ark, who cheer the others from below and testify 
to the rescue of fame while they themselves are forgotten. They are the miserable and the wretched of the earth. The anonymous foot soldier, as Didi Übermann writes, quote, who among the hundreds or thousands of his fellows is just there to figure the battle scene from which the hero will emerge triumphant or will become the wounded hero and has nothing to do but walk, pointing a bayonet and pretend to fall down dead at a given moment. So I'm going, this was the quote by Didi Übermann that I read to you and I'm just showing you some pictures so that you know what I'm talking about when I talk about um, extras in cinema and um, uh, there are a lot of extras in classical Hollywood cinema and I'm just showing you some pictures here so that you can see the foot soldiers and the slaves cheering to even Gandhi. Um, and who are the cannon fodder, who fall down dead at a given moment. Frequently, the many extras that populate the screen have been described as abundant, as a luxury on display which characterizes Hollywood cinema of the classical era in particular, and is reflected not least in the enormous costs, here's Cleopatra, uh, the big budgets of grand genre films. In regard to the Hollywood historical epic, Vivian Sobchak puts forward the argument that, quote, the genre, so the, um, um, uh, the historical epic in classical Hollywood, formally repeats the surge, splendor, and extravagance, the human labor and capital cost entailed by its narrative's historical content in both its production process and its mode of uh, representation. History emerges in popular consciousness not so much from any particular accuracy or even specificity of detail and event as it does from a transcendence of accuracy and specificity enabled by a general um, and excessive parade and accumulation of detail and events, end of quote. In terms of a politics of aesthetics, however, these excesses of surge and splendor involving the human labor of hundreds and thousands of extras also not only expose luxury, but a lack or shortage, a lack of social care, trade union organization, legal representation, adequate payment, recognition through the granting of a credit and so on. So extras are the underclass of the film industry. The exploitation of their labor, their bodies, their precarious lives is quite well documented uh, in social historical studies of Hollywood's studio system. And these many are what I shall deal with in the following and will, I will make some general remarks before I will come to speak about a film with a cast of over 200 people with the uh, attempt to overcome the status of the extras and to voice the uh, interests of all those people who would usually, in uh, a Hollywood epic or even a, um, um, another film, would be cast as extras. Extras in the English uh, uh, term um, all, already points to the uh, supernumeraries to the surplus to the economic dimensions of extra costs of film production. But what I'm more interested is in is the German word for extras. In German language, the word for extras, Statisten, which is more commonly used in the plural than in the singular, was introduced into theatre vocabulary in the middle of the 18th century to describe an <coughs> Uh, insignificant and silent stage presence. In this uh, theater encyclo uh, encyclopedia uh, for the German stage, for example, it says of the extras that they 
only be people who are trained for their marches, processions, battles, people's assemblies after command, trained um, um, without, uh, without any will at all, just doing what they have been trained to do by the stage manager and which are either soldiers, so military extras, or people of the lower classes from the city, citizen extras. So you can read here Statistenstummen, neben uh, Personen auf dem Theater, die nur zur Vervollständigung des Bühnenbildes dienen um, und bloß durch ihr Erscheinen auf den Gang der Handlung einzuwirken haben. Und dann kommt es hier auf die äh, niederen äh, Volksklassen oder Soldaten. So, um, Statisten, we may deduce from this, are so called because they are subject to the command not to act as someone else, namely the character of a play, but to populate the stage, to enact their own inferior social standing or status through their new presence. Significantly, the German word for extras, Statisten, is derived from the Latin uh, status, for standing in the sense of the general position of a person, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, the Latin status from which the uh, uh, German word statisten for extras is derived means standing in the sense of the general position of a person or a whole community and its members. And that's just the way how Cicero, for example, uses the word when he speaks of the status civitatis or the status republici. Um, the relation between status and communitas is a complicated one if we call into mind that the Latin communitas, originating from munus for gift, meant above all the obligation to pay a tribute or a debt, including taxes, which by Roman law did not apply to all to the same extent. This is a fact to which uh, Roberto Esposito, in his very skeptical approach to existing concepts of community, has drawn our attention. By the time of the 16th century, during which the word status and its derivates informed notions of the state with a capital S, it had acquired a somewhat different meaning. Until the French Revolution in 1789 and even later, Quote, the state meant primarily the position of being the superior or supreme political authority, and thence it came to be applied derivatively to the person or body enjoying that position, end of quote. So the term status in the sense of state referred to, to the doctrine of state or political science, which developed in connection with the political history in Europe and concerns the territory as well as the administrative apparatus, the fiscal system, the princely sovereign rights and the rights and duties of the cooperative class society as well as the representation of power. Statistics as a scientific discipline emerged in the 18th century when uh, Gottfried Aachenwall, uh, who is regarded as the founder of uh, statistics, and he gave the German, so his German term, statistic, was imported into uh, other languages, so he has also given the discipline its name, published in 1749 his outline of the newest political science of today's nobles, European empires and republics, Abriss der neuesten Staatswissenschaft der vornehmsten europäischen Reiche und Republiken. It is precisely at this historical moment, with the advent of statistics in the middle of the 18th century, that the extras on the stage became known as Statisten. No one has ever written about this. <laughs> I consider it, or at least I didn't find anything, I consider it worthwhile to keep in mind this historical relation of the extras to statistics which, originally, which originated in cameralistic or mercantilistic political science in the age of absolutism before it became the science 
of recording and researching the numerical frequency of certain phenomena in nature and society as we know statistics today. In the decades following the French Revolution, statistics underwent major changes extending beyond its focus on the description of the state to that of society involving administrative practices and techniques of formalization centered on numbers and calculations, including summaries, encoding, summing, calculations, and the creation of graphs and tables. In this context, it is not surprising that the already mentioned theater encyclopedia published in 1841 contains above all references to the administration and renumeration, the numerical description and recording of the extras. However, as Alain Desrosiers notes in The Politics of Large Numbers, this is a seminal study of the history of statistics, it is impossible to separate the state from society. And he writes, quote, the state was constituted into particular forms of relationships between individuals. These forms were organized and codified to varying degrees and could therefore be objectified mainly by means of statistics. From this point of view, the state was a particular ensemble of social ties that had solidified and that individuals recognized as social things." End of quote. From this viewpoint, community results from a set of practices related to the description and management of the state as well as society, amongst them practices of numbering, calculating and measuring that regulate the social, juridical, fiscal and economical sphere. These practices, through transcending the singularities of individual or local situations, create a common ground for the statistical description of the social world. And I think we should keep in mind that one of the major political objectives and accomplishments of the French Revolution and the National Convention as its first government were the creation of a space of common norms and standards with its unification of weights and measures and the introduction of the metric system in order to ensure the universality of measurement in accordance with the universality of the rights of man. All men are born and remain free and equal, and this had to be based on common norms and standards. The practices of numbering, calculating and measuring are, as we can see, deeply entangled into the political history of establishing and maintaining social and state order. And they are highly ambivalent in that they enact control and exercise power on the one hand and ensure the equivalence of all men and guarantee the fairness of their social interaction, maybe not only in trade, on the other. For Alain Badiou, numbering and counting constitute the general basis of state sovereignty and control. In his major philosophical uh, work, Being and Event, published in 1988, as well as in Number and Numbers, which can be considered as an appendix of the former book, he makes plausible the idea that the state is a political structure of order based on counting. It is through operations of counting that a social connection between the elements of society is established, namely through counting the multiple as one. Here you see an image of Spartacus, so we're back with the extras just to remind you. And here you see what actually is the uh, background, seeing the background people holding up these numbers. So numbering is um, a pra common practice in the organization of extras on the film set. They do not have names, they have numbers when they are addressed. The practices of numbering, calculating and, um, sorry, um, it is through operations of um, numbering, calculating and counting that a social connection between the elements of society is established. So what is counted becomes, according to Badiou, identifiable 
um, as an element of the state, thus it is, that's his idea, presented. But only what is recounted is also represented as a part in the framework of the state. Political forces are elements that are presented without being represented, that belong to the count without being included in it, included in it are, the potential, are, are the potentiality of an upcoming event. The event in Badiou's understanding, as you all know, breaks with the authority of the mathematical laws of being. It is a supernumerary that is uncountable and it's a state beyond being an extra or a statist. In Badiou's political reflection on historical situations in which an event interrupts the law of unity and the representation of the census, the Paris Commune alongside the French Revolution on May 68 Arnold Schoenberg's 12-tone technique in musical composition, or Georg Cantor's revolution discovery of the un uncountability of real numbers in set theory. Don't ask me to explain the Überabzählbarkeitsbeweis in der Mengenlehre to you, but this is on which um, Badiou's argument is based. And so this occupies a central position in his thought. He writes, what is exactly in terms of its uh, manifest content, this beginning called March 18, he asks, and his answer is, the appearing of a worker being, to this very day a social symptom, a brute force or uprisings, and a theoretical threat in the space of governmental and political, political capacity. In the context of these thoughts, the photograph that you see here showing the last communards shot by government troops on the uh, 28th of May 1871 at the wall of Père Lachaise Cemetery. Their corpse is numbered, as you can see, seems particularly striking. It was taken by uh, André Adolphe Eugène Disdery, the inventor of the fashionable carte de visite photograph, who was commissioned by the police to document the communards' defeat and execution after the event at the end of the so-called Bloody May Week, uh, 1871, when the government defeated the commune. And defeat of revolution here means re-establishment of order through counting as an operation of exclusion from the state of a situation. In many respects, the Paris Commune of 1871 can be regarded as the first appearance of the proletariat in photography, with the photographic image becoming a site of their struggle for political representation. However, the numbering of the dead bodies, these corpses from, uh, here's another um, image by Disdery, these corpses um, from which um, all signs of political engagement and social life are stripped away with the removal of clothes, discredits this image politics of representation. No names, only numbers, as Jules Clarity, the director of the Comédie Française and staff officer in the National Guard during the um, uh, Paris Commune, described this scene of photographic staging of the dead, and as he was a man of the theater, he understood that this was a staging. What is evident, though, is the gesture of the criminalization of the body of the revolutionary, of providing information and data that would inform later practices of police photography, as those refined by Alphonse Batillon, who was a French police officer and, of course, a son of a statistician, by putting photography in the service of anthropometric measurement in order to allow for more accurate identification of criminals. And you can see that it is a very standardized uh, process. I would like to think of Peter Watkins' film about the Paris uh, Commune, originally produced for television and plainly titled La Commune, Paris, 1871, as a critical engagement with the operations of counting as a foundational practice of the state order through the figure of the extra, the statist, that is so intimately related 
to statistical reasoning and thought. Watkins' film tells of the events of the temporary assumption of power by the Central Committee of the National Guard and the formation of a local um, council as an elected body of the people, the um, Paris Commune, formed by revolutionaries during the Franco-German War of 1871, after the collapse of the Second Empire and the foundation of the Third Republic to administer Paris according to socialist ideas against the central government of Adolf Thiers. They sought the reorganization of society on the basis of liberal and humanist principles. They aimed to represent the people, particularly the interests of workers, and to improve the living conditions through social reforms and they also, as we know, attempted to forcibly defend the autonomy they had attained by ordering the arming of the people uh, and to blow up the National Assembly of Versailles. The Paris uh, Commune had been characterized precisely by attempting to transform the democratic principle of political representation into a principle of local self-government to fill the city's empty assembly rooms and offices abandoned by state power in order to test entirely new forms of political organization beyond central and hierarchical rule. The film's cast is made up of over 220 persons from Paris and the banlieue, more than half of them non-professionals including sans-papier, so illegal immigrants from Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia. In one of the intertitles of Peter Watkins' film, we are informed that it was precisely the active participation of these people in the making of the film that frightened the world's media and is probably one of the main reasons for the refusal of funding by the many TV channels requested to provide support. The film, um, and this is important to mention, had a very unfortunate production history. It was funded by the Franco-German television network La Set Arte, these were the only ones to give money, uh, which eventually uh, self-censored um, the film, considering it not prime time suitable, and um, broadcasted only once in the middle of the night while hardly anyone was watching. Unnoticed by the public and dismissed by the press, it was then shown as part of an exhibition about the Commune at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Watkins had refused to make the cuts which Arte demanded and Arte had not edited the film on video cassette as initially planned. The speculation about the possible reasons for the reluctance or even hostility of the media towards the film continues in another intertitle. What the media are particularly afraid of is that the little man on the little screen will be replaced by a multitude of people by the public. The film aimed to overcome the status of the extra. You see here Armand Gatti um, addressing the extras and saying in this adventure you are not merely extras, you are creators. But in a documentation on the film process, we can also see that it was impossible to voice the interests of 220 participants. So even here we have extras, this little girl saying, I play Catholic orphan number 10, I have no last name. And we, here we see her in her mute performance. Watkins critique is not limited to representation, but extends on the process of production on the division of labor and the standardization of workflows in the film, in, is, uh, in the film uh, industry. Contrary to the usual film practice, in which the actors, as we know, enter the production process only after the script is written, after the characters and dialogues are fully developed and sketched on paper here, the protagonists were involved in the process of developing the roles and writing their dialogues their parole from the very beginning. After a long period of preparation, which lasted more than 16 months, the protagonists studied the history of the commune intensively under the guidance of a team of historians and researchers. 
and then the film was shot without a script in the chronological order of the historical events, relying on on-the-spot improvisation in only 13 days in an abandoned factory in Montreux on the site of the former film studio of Georges Méliès. This labor of collective negotiation of roles and representational spaces becomes manifest in the film's duration of nearly six hours. Just as the classical historical epic, the film so formally repeats here the human labor entailed by its narrative's historical content in both its production process and modes of forms of representation, yet this aims neither at the display of surge and splendor, nor to that of Lacan's shortage, but to an approximation of what the members of the Paris Commune, almost all of them who belong to the proletariat, called communal, communal luxury, a term that Eugène Potier used in his manifesto of the Artists' Association of the Paris Commune to describe common prosperity that included the distribution of beauty of aesthetic experience into the public space. Um, and I need three more minutes. Um, so the film eventually becomes the sediment of its own production process, blurring the boundaries between fiction and documentary, between the staging of history and the improvisation of the present. The protagonists' um, own experiences and thoughts permeate the characters' dialogues while they speak their lines, they at the same time also voice their own current social situation. So there are a lot of overlaps like a palimpsest of analog analogies and anachronisms between past and present in the film. Towards the end of the film, the historical plot is interspersed with scenes that reverse the relationship between front and backstage when the extras, dressed in costume, reflect on the film as a site or space for the negotiation of positions and relations in a collective process. But um, Peter Watkins has also said that for him he also tried to maintain control over the production as a director, so this was a conflict, it was part of the whole situation. Um, and uh, I will, um, here you can see him <laughs> um, entering this conflict, um, uh, and I will skip a part. Um, oh, is important, but I'm just mentioning very shortly, uh, where he invents a media environment of television in order to um, self-criticize uh, the standards in which um, um, public interests are addressed in the news um, and also, uh, yes, the uh, um, limiting form of it, uh, addressing these interests. So, um, within this staged media environment, the actor's performance becomes an effort of a redistribution of representational power. Who speaks, who is seen and heard, who broadcasts. Resulting from the film's shooting, a group of the participants founded the collective Le Rebond pour la Commune to continue the participatory process of social experimentation and critical debate after the completion of the film. This collective, it is non-hierarchically organized and it still exists today, is committed to the organization of public events, talks and discussions, including the film's diffusion in alternative networks outside the official distribution channels. So the actors recorded the film while it was um, broadcasted only once in the middle of the night and then they um, showed the um, uh, VHS recording in these um, public sessions. And they also found a cooperative for the um, autonomous production and distribution of media content. The image, however, in this film never fully becomes a commonplace, like Didi Übermann said, where the commonplace of images of the people used to raise. In its place, we find a site of contestation and conflict of struggling and opposing forces of, experiment, uh, of experimentation and play, in short, of a crisis as the potentiality of community. And here's a last quote, this is for the water. We disagree 
Uh, that is bad. No, it is good. That is movement, writes Brecht in his play, The Days of the Commune. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.